Welcome back to New to Medical Device Sales. I am your host, Jacob McLaughlin, and today I have the pleasure of being here in actually Los Angeles with my CEO, uh, Elliot Street, who is the CEO of Innovis, but not only the CEO, is a surgeon, an ex-collegiate tennis player, and all the above, which you guys are going to find out on this show. So, Elliot, thanks for joining us today, man. Yeah, great, great to see you, Jacob. Uh, <laughs> great, great to be here on the West Coast, and uh, thanks for having me on the pod. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. So, as you guys will see, uh, Elliot is not from America. <laughs> he has, uh, he's much more enjoyable to listen to. That's why we're going to have him talking a lot more today. But the reason I wanted to bring Elliot on is, you know, he's a CEO. He's the one who's building a business, but also hiring. And to get the most value for you guys, I wanted you to hear his uh, his story on how he's got to where he's at today, but also what he looks for in the people that he's hiring. So real quick, like Elliot, can you just kind of go back into your background? Um, yeah. How you grew up, kind of all that good stuff to give the listeners yeah, on who you are? Yeah, sure. Th- thanks, Jacob. So um, yeah, yeah. Gr- grew up in uh, primarily in South Wales. Um, and it, it's, it's a really interesting piece around uh, about the concept of breaking in because I basically spent my entire life trying to break into difficult things. Um, and, and the first of those was, was sports. Mm-hmm. So I uh, grew up playing tennis, uh, was, was a pretty good tennis player, but when you start getting to certain levels, um, it, it becomes not only difficult to break in just because the, the standard is high and the quality is high, but um, it becomes difficult to break in from a political standpoint and, and making sure that your, your friends are all the right people. Yeah. So yeah, gr- grew up playing loads of tennis uh, as a kid, um, managed to break into the, the, the national team as a, as a junior, uh, played and represented my country for, uh, for, for many years there. Um, and I was looking, when I was getting to sort of 16, 17, having to make that decision around, am I gonna go and play professional tennis or am I gonna go and play college tennis um, in, in the US? And it, it was a real difficult one because I was like, I like the idea of going to, to the US and, and playing some college tennis. And yeah. um, it just so happened that I was lucky enough to be the member of a big tennis club um, uh, back home where there was lots of surgeons, lots of doctors. And they all said, well, hang on, you're not, you're not the, the, the bluntest instrument. Um, <laughs> w- would you consider going to medical school? And, and there's, no, there's no doctors or surgeons in my family. So I didn't mm. even know what medical school was. Mm. Um, so we looked at this and I said, well, look guys, I don't know what that is. Can you please help me understand w- what medical school even is? So spent some time doing some work experience with these guys. Yeah. Um, and this is the first, the first piece here, which is, I think when it comes to breaking in uh, into anything, whether that's medical device sales or whatever it may well be, um, you have to be as coachable as possible. Um, because I-, I was sitting there going, look, I-, I could go on a scholarship here to the US, have a great time. but." This thing here, this profession of surgery and medicine sounds really, really interesting, um, but I have no idea what I'm doing, so I'm gonna need to listen to these experts who are gonna coach me into medical school. Yeah. So um, this is my first like, proper breaking in story that I'm gonna talk about, and that's how, that's how you get into medical school. This is a kid from just a really normal state school, so I didn't go to like a, a, like a well-known, privately educated school where sort of the, the, the clear funnel is <laughs> go to medical school. I'm not from a dynasty of surgeons, I'm not from a dynasty of doctors. Um, and you'd be surprised how, how the odds are really stacked against you in that scenario. Yeah, um, and just so you guys know, I just interrupt real quick, mm-hmm. is like, so university is different. So they call it uni or university yeah. in England. Um, and it's not like our med school where it's you go for four years, get an under, uh, your undergraduate, then you go take the MCAT, then you're going for four more years and all that. Your guys is a little different process. Sure. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll talk the guys through that. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah. So in the UK, you actually go straight into medical school from from high school. Yeah. So, so you go straight to college from high school. Um, so you're 18 when you're going through this process, uh, deciding this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life, and you go through that process of going to medical school. That's then five or six years, depending on uh, the, the type of program that you do. And then once you've completed medical school, then you, you come into your internships, our equivalent of an internship, which is called the foundation years in the UK. Okay. So that, that's how this works. So I'm there, I'm 18. Um, I've been playing tennis basically my, my entire childhood. And that's pretty much what I've lived for the whole time. Uh, and now I'm like, okay, uh, how are we going to break into this like incredibly, incredibly high barrier to entry yeah. thing, which is medical school? The, the applications are, they're like 14 to one. So for every 14 people that apply, one person gets in. And if you think about the quality of people, that's not, of those 14, 10 of them are ropey people that are just chucking a speculative application. And these are all re- like the, yeah. the top 1% of the, of the country. So when we're talking about breaking in and coachability, this is super important. 
so I was learning as much as I could quickly about, about medicine and healthcare. And it just so happens that I learned about surgery because I got coached by these surgeons. And I, I was like, this is really exciting. This is a really cool profession. I'd really like to do this. And then I was like, okay, I'm gonna get my head down and understand as much about this as I possibly can. So that if I'm lucky enough to get to the point where I get interviews at medical school, I'm gonna be able to talk really sensibly about the profession that I want to go. So I go in with a focus. And we'll, we'll talk about focus throughout the, yeah. uh, the, the, the piece today because focus is another really important piece. Coachability is incredibly important, but focus is important too. Um, the, the other thing that's important when we're breaking into, in my opinion, when you're breaking into difficult things, and I, I use this example all the time, Jacob, um, <laughs> I honestly use it all the time when I think about sales, when we think about marketing, when we think about anything in the business. I use the analogy of to get into medical school, and I'm pretty sure this is the same this side of the pond as well. Yeah. You don't get into medical school because you were like the captain of all the sports teams, because you were like grade eight on every instrument. That's our gradings for how good people are at yeah. instruments. I don't know if that works <laughs> over here in the States as well. Uh, because you had all the straight A's at college, because you did a load of charity work, um, because you're really engaging and genial. You get in because you do all of those and you do them to a standard miles beyond yep. everyone else. Yep. That's how you get in. Yep. So you have to leave literally no stone unturned, exactly. otherwise you're leaving things to chance yep. when it comes to medical school. So we're talking about my story there. Um, yeah, coachability and being humble enough to go, okay, like, I, think I'm, I think I'm relatively sharp, but I don't know anything about this industry. Let's absorb, like a sponge, as much information as I possibly can. Then let's curate this the CV. So I went about this in a really, really focused way. So it was probably about 17 that I was starting to look at this. And I sat down with these surgeons and these doctors at my tennis club and I said, right, it, from my opinion, these are the things I'm going to need to do in quite a, quite a strategic fashion. So or, already captain of the sports teams and, and got international caps for tennis. So that's, that's really quite helpful. Yep. I'd always worked as well. I'd always had a side hustle of some description, <laughs> washing pots, working yep. on a farm, um, just grinding. So that was really useful because it showed resilience to the people yep. that, would be, um, that would be interviewing us. But then I said, what else do I now need to do? So I went and sought out the work experience with the surgeons, but then I got some varied work experience. So I spent time with the A&E doctors mm. and took coaching from them. Um, and I was like, that's not, still not gonna be enough because I don't play any instruments. So I haven't got the instruments column that I can tick off here. And I hadn't really spent that much time. In the UK, we do these things like Duke of Edinburgh Award and these other extracurricular okay. things, which are really good for your sort of personal CV as a child. Um, but I'd spent my entire time either grinding it out like washing up pots in a pub or playing tennis and so i was like what else do i need to do so i started um going out and investigating how i could get involved in some charity work yeah. which, which is actually super important to me <clears throat> even to today yeah um and, and we may get a chance to talk about charity of the year for, for innovus as well at some point in time so that i didn't just do it because that was something that could get me there i've always done that and liked it but i wanted to do stuff that was really focused on how can i take that experience and it will add value to this process of breaking into medical school yeah so we did all that in the uk you're only allowed to apply to four medical schools you're only allowed to make four applications wow. So you have to be really, really strategic about where you apply. And I applied to two of the biggest and, uh, and, and best recognized in the country and, and two mid to high level ones. So I wanted to give myself a spread. Yep. And, and this is another really important point when it comes to breaking yep. in. You, you, have to, you have to be humble enough to go, yeah, I, I wanna work for, or go to or work with the number one brand of X, Y, and Z. Um, but you don't know if you're going to be able to do that. Even yep. if you've ticked all those boxes yep. and you've got all those things I've just spoken 100%. about for medical school, I was like, I'm not going to apply to Imperial, Cambridge, Oxford, and Manchester because they're the four hardest to get into. I'll apply to two of them and I'll apply to two others that are certainly difficult still to get into, mm -hmm. but you still stand a good chance. And would you rather go to medical school or not go to medical school yeah. is the question. No, exactly. So I took that approach. I applied to four. I got four interviews. Amazingly, I did all of that work and the, what the medical school I ended up going to was in Manchester, which is one of the most prestigious medical schools in the country. Um, and my entire interview was based around tennis. <laughs> it, was, it was brilliant. Uh, I was like, this is great. Uh, I was like, they clearly just want me to come here and play for their, yeah. their collegiate sports team, which yeah. is, it's, it's not quite the same in the UK. It's not as, not as big in the UK, yeah. um, but they certainly, they certainly pride themselves on doing well in, in sports. So um, yeah, that, that helped. I, I'll never forget. Um, and 
you probably had something similar with Innovus, I think, uh, in your interview recently with us. Um, but at the end of my medical school interview, uh, the dean of the medical school who was on the panel finished the interview with, uh, the, the comment was, I guess that's game, set and match to Mr. Street. And I walked out of there and I was just like, they can't not give me a place now. They, ha they, ha they have to give me a place after that. Otherwise, that's just so unfair. Um, so so look, what, what's the point of that story? It's, it's really important that we're providing um, the value to, to, your, to your listeners and, and, uh, and your viewers. So the point of that story is medical school is incredibly hard to break into. And when I think about then prof professions and people breaking into professions, whether it's med device sales or any role that they, they want in our industry or, or elsewhere, just take that same attitude. You have to take that same approach. Yep. Um, just to summarize, what are we speaking about? Be coachable, yep. be humble. So, so don't, don't just say, I, I only want this. Yep. Be humble about where, where you feel that you can get to. Yep. And then just over-prepare. Love it. And I think probably that over-prepare piece leads us into your other question, which is what do we look for in, uh, in people um, when, we're, when we're bringing people into Innovus? Yeah, yeah. And that's where we'll get into that. The thing I want you guys to go is just rewind that about 30 seconds and go into it. Because the coachable part, we've talked about that on yeah. the podcast a bunch. And just because, again, you... Again, when you're going into a new industry, you don't know what you don't know. And that's what we talk about all the time. And so it's like, can you, can you be humble enough again to be like, I, I'm going to go, I'm going to go after it, but I also, I know I have a lot to learn. And that's where I've gotten to, you know, positions where I've been in, in my own life is I'm just, I, I don't imagine that I know everything and I don't act like I know everything, but I'll figure it out. And yeah. that's by using resources and helping um, and going to the whole humble part. I really want to touch on that because we've talked about this on the podcast lately. I have a lot of people who message me and be like, I don't want an associate, I'm too good for that, or I got my four-year degree. And I'm like, and that's the whole important reason why you're not breaking it. It's because you think you're too good for an associate sales rep, but you're not even in the industry. Yeah. You, you haven't even broken, you haven't done anything, but you're thinking you're too good to be a part of this team. And same thing with companies. They'll, they'll know a company because they just Googled it. That's yeah. it, and, or somebody told them, and that's all they know. They haven't done their own research. And then they'll be like, they'll, I've gotten people, even in our course, where, they'll be like, hey, this company reached out to me, but I don't think I'm gonna go with them. I don't, they're not big enough. And I'm like, did you even give them a shot? Hmm. Did they give you a chance to sell? You already predetermined something yeah. before you even got to know, is the CEO a cool guy? Does he have a good English <laughs> accent? Stuff like that, you know? Yeah. Uh, so going with that one, and the last one, no, no stone unturned. And that's something I preached my whole life is like, I, I actually, in my video, I know you saw it, where I came to Innovis and like when I went that, it's like when I go in the interview, I just smile and I say, Sorry, like I already won it. And even if I didn't win it, you know, I already feel because I'm like, I over prepared and I'm yeah. like looking at them. I'm like, I know I thought of stuff you didn't. I know I reached out to more people and I know I already worked harder. Yeah. I did more research than you could have thought of. The, the research piece, what, while we're on this, is it, when you sit on the other side. So, my, my, my opening story there is about me sitting on, on this side of the bench. I'm the one being, into, I'm the one prepping. Yep. And there's, I'll, I'll, I'll give another story about that. It was another high barrier to entry breaking in piece. There's two maybe that we'll get to touch on. But now I sit on the other side as, as, as the guy looking to bring people into what is effectively my, my family yep. as uh, our business. Yep. Um, the people we spend all our time with, look, we're spending a week together in, <laughs> in, in, in LA and, and San Francisco now. So um, we spend a lot of time with these people. And when I sit on that side of it, it is astonishing how obvious it is when someone has or hasn't done their research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it's amazing. And I always open, um, I mean, you, you've been through our process. We've got a really structured, <laughs> really structured place. So we run, we run in of us like a blue chip company, but yep. with all of the agility and speed and, and dynamism of a startup still. Yep. Um, but our processes are really well trodden for our hiring. And one of those processes is a first stage interview, right? So we've not met each other, first stage interview, the first two questions you get asked are tell us what Innovus does. And the, 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 the range of answers you'll get, I've honestly had someone turn around and say, I actually don't know, um, which is not a particularly good start. That's not leaving <laughs> stones unturned. Um, that's, that's, re that, that's not gonna end well. But then you'll get people that give a, a cursory answer and we're doing it right now. We're, we're building out, we're, we're expanding the team in the UK at the moment. I just did an interview before getting on the plane um, uh, from, from Heathrow to, to LA yesterday. And the, 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 the answer was so detailed that that person would have had to have spent maybe five or six hours watching video content yep. from our YouTube channel to have pulled out some of those pieces. Yep. And that immediately stands them out to say, almost it doesn't matter what you say now for the next 
hour of this interview, yep. it's highly likely you're going to end up in the final stage because that itself shows how much you care. Yep. And that you've got the the things we look for, which is detail orientated, yeah. m making sure that you're really thinking about this in the right way. So and putting yeah. in the work, that like that person did the work to like yeah. hey make sure they came prepared. Um, and the one I wanted to just circle off that going off of the interview questions um, because within the first fifteen minutes I thought I bombed our uh, <laughs> our interview um, and, I, and I'll go into uh, you know what the question he asked me was an anatomy question yeah. about the GI and if you guys know like I was in the GYN space so I knew GI when I was in anatomy school in college uh, but I could not tell you the anatomy of the GI at that moment when I was interviewing uh, and we'll touch on this I think it's really important for those looking to break in so if you're if you're hiring if you're going through the process with a company that actually has a decent decent process they should be testing they, they should be test every every part of our hiring process is a test yep. Even if someone thinks it's just really basic, oh, they've asked me to fill these forms out. Yep. I'm looking at, and the rest of our team are looking at, how did you go about filling the form out? Did you leave 50% of it blank? Yeah. Did you send it to the email address that you were asked to send it to? Did you only send 50% of the documents to that email address? All of that is showing this person is not that detail orientated and they're really not taking it that seriously. Yep. And, and that's what it projects yep. to us. So when we go through that process, we ask people then, a load of questions. So we have this capability screening form. Uh, and as Jacob just alluded to there, it, it talks about, and this is for sales managers, right? So this, this is talking about sales experience, marketing experience, but also background anatomy experience. And let's just give the, the viewers a little bit of idea of why we actually ask for that. So we, we're a clinician-led, clinician-founded business. Yep. We've always interacted with our end users and our customers as peers. Yep. Uh, we're, we're seen as subject matter experts. It's really powerful. And it's really important for us as we scale myself, my co-founder Jordan, uh, and the other clinicians in the team, that the people we bring in either already have the background knowledge or are willing and able to learn it. Yep. But there's another piece to that, which is as a salesperson, you don't want to show that you don't know something. So it's a really important test, and this is another part of these, these constant tests that we're putting in in our hiring processes, which is we put a capability screening form here, and it's asking you about things like background anatomy knowledge, uh, background surgical knowledge, procedural knowledge in, in these specialties, and you have to rank yourself. So effectively expert level, um, medium level, and, and aware of, so I, I don't really know much about that. Yep. And you get three of these categories that you get to put it in. Again, this is a test to are people doing their research but there's another thing about being humble as well. So the research piece. They know that the person that's going to be interviewing them, if they've done their research, is a surgeon with an anatomy degree as well. Yep. So if you put extensive knowledge in anatomy <laughs> and you can't answer a simple anatomy question, that, that's a real issue because what I would rather see is someone rank it lower yep. and then I'll ask the questions as we go to find out, has this person got the ability to say some words which are difficult medical words, which therefore means they can obviously have the ability to learn the words that we need to teach them and we'll train them when they come into the team. Yep. Um, and are they humble enough to say, yeah, or, or have they done their research? The guy probably shouldn't put extensive because this guy's probably got relatively extensive knowledge. Um, so I'm going to make sure that I, I get the balance of that. So yep. it's really, really important in that hiring process. If anyone's going through that process with, with whoever the, the company is, um, everyone will have different processes, but just think that everything they are asking you to do is a test at every stage. Yep. It, if they've asked you to do something in a specific way, read, reread, and read it again. Yep. Say, oh, they've asked me to do these documents and send them to this email address. Don't, don't, don't do only 50% of the documents, because a hiring manager will look at that, yep. like I do, and go, mm, okay, I mean, I'm not gonna write them off, but that's, that's going down in the tick box yeah. of their objective scoring. Yeah. Uh, and we score people all the way through the process. And we'll touch on this very briefly, but we've just built out our team here in the, in the States. We, we hired Pan-American. So we've hired people in the, the East, Central Region, and the West. It literally came down to fractional marking on an objective score sheet for the, for the guys that we offered the roles to you'd be out an incredibly tenured person for your role who was brilliant, mm -hmm. brilliant. And, and uh, the pair of you performed brilliantly throughout the whole thing. And if one of you had made a slip up of, okay, I didn't do this thing, um, that probably could have, cost, could have cost you the role. 100%, and that's where I just wanna to touch on that. I'm glad you said it because I tell these guys, 
you can't afford to mess up. That's mm. the value of doing your research, doing it, because it could be one thing that could cost you that job and you going through that process and always making sure, but making sure that you guys are humble, like we're talking about, but if you don't know something, the better answer, because a surgeon, the worst thing you can ever do is lie to a surgeon or say, because the surgeon knows. Don't black it. No, and they already no. know. So it's like, if you're going in it, I wanted to touch on that, but to that extent where you guys are, it's a test. We could have stopped the podcast right there. Everything's a test in the interview process. Yeah. If they tell you to do something, that is a test. And the reason I'm going into so much detail is because I have you guys reach out to me and it will be like, oh, they sent me this, but I didn't really follow up. Or I did this and then you, these are the people who are wondering why they're not getting hired. It's going back to leaving no stone unturned. You yeah. guys have to make sure that you're over delivering on every aspect and every process that is either thought of or not even thought of. And that's where like, again, when you're going and talking about landing big jobs with big companies and, and beating out a lot of people, are you doing what other people just didn't even think about doing yeah. to help you stand? Because like we talked about over prepare, doing the general or just getting enough 100% isn't good enough. Yeah. Everyone's trying to do 100%. You gotta be above 100% yeah. to try to get that job. And, and it's really important, we, we, use, um, we use something called Belbin profiling in our, in our yeah. hiring and, and in our, our team building and management. It's a really, really important tool for us. It gets people working um, just optimally as, as teams, but we then look at it because um, when you look at Belvin profiles, it's a it, it's not psychometric um, profiling; it's a behavioural profiling. So, mm -hmm. what behaviours is this person um, more inclined to enjoy yep. versus more inclined to not enjoy? Yep. And one of those behaviours is nine. Um, but by the way, anyone that's listening, again, here's a nugget for you: you want to go and stand out in an interview. And there's a process. So a lot of the big blue chips have they use Gallup or Disc or whatever yep. Myers Briggs. Well, Belbin's not like as mainstream, but it's so powerful. So here's a tip before I carry on talking about what I was going to talk about. Go away and read about Belbin. And when you turn up to an interview, or, and put, try and put yourself through a Belbin, turn up to your interview with your Belbin and say, here is my Belbin, and this is why these things would make me really good at this job because of my, the way my behaviors are aligned. That's doing something that no one else will do. 100%. We, we talk to everyone in our team at Innovus, when we're, when we're bringing people into the company, we have a low attrition rate, so this doesn't really happen. But what I say to anyone is, look, if you get to the point where there's an opportunity in your career that's something you want to move to, great, let's talk about how you're going to go ahead and go and get that opportunity. Yep. And let's talk about, Belbin is a really powerful tool because you've already got it. Let's talk about it before you go to your interview. And, and take that with you. It's it, honestly, if, if I'm sitting there and I'm the hiring manager, and someone came to me, that's a, that's a big tick. That's that's like a differentiator. If this person and this person are ranked the same, yeah. that's the sort of thing that would differentiate them. Let me let me carry on talking about Belbin. There's a there's a profile, one of the nine. It's called Resource Investigator. Resource Investigator is the person that is, and for sales managers, Resource Investigator is is like almost like a prerequisite. You have to have it. Yeah. It's that ability to go out hunting. So am I gonna go out and, and source the information that I need? Am I gonna go out and, and do things differently to what other people? So resource investigation would be, I've, I've gone and I've, I've listened to what Elliot said on Jacob's podcast. I've gone and found what Belbin is. I found a local Belbin provider. I've done my Belbin and I'm taking it to my next interview and I'm gonna talk about that. Now, the caveat to that is, you must rely on the fact that the, the hiring manager is switched on enough to, to understand, <laughs> understand that that's a good thing. <laughs> Which, um, that is another question that, or another thing uh, that needs to be stated. We talk about this and we laugh about it all the time, but just, just understand you guys, just because people hold high positions at certain companies doesn't mean that it's like they're the most go after, understand everything that you put in front of them. Sure. Like, yeah. Yeah, and, and if, they're, if they're not really reacting to, to something like that, then you've got one of two options. They're not reacting to it. Is, and, and, you, and you're, you're listening to this going, I, I completely identify with what Elliot and Jacob are saying, that's genius, that, that's, of course I'm gonna do that. And then you get into an interview and there's no real reaction from the hiring manager. It's a two-way process, like when we're hiring, I am, I'm spending all my time selling Innovus and the opportunity to really great people like Jacob and everyone else that we have in our team. So when you're looking at it, and it's that balance of being humble but also knowing your value, yep. If you're looking going, they, they've, they've not even reacted to that. Is that the sort of place I want to be? It may well be. It may be that they're not the most entrepreneurial of business and bigger business and the hiring manager's going through their process and they're not allowed to move off that. Yeah. But if you're a super entrepreneur, entrepreneurial person and you want to be in a dynamic environment, yeah. you can maybe test the water because then you can make the decision halfway through the interview and go, 
this maybe won't be the place for me. So now I'm gonna now I'm gonna take some risks in my interview. And I just want to, if it's okay, oh. uh, I just want to take a step back to, <laughs> to, to medical school interviews and, and breaking in there. Because the other thing is, um, always think about your your past experiences and how and how transferable they are. Yep. Uh, everything I do as a CEO, I basically learned from medical school. Yep. Communication, empathy all of the ability to take really, really complex information and, and, and distill that down to people in a, in a succinct way, all of these things. But medical school interview is another transferable skill. So, so here we go, when I'm, when I'm training, and we were just doing reps, I did hundreds of reps of medical school mock interviews with surgeons and the doctors at my tennis club. And then I was like, okay guys, we need some coping strategies for plan A, plan B and plan C, like I would have if I was on the tennis court. My game on the tennis court, massive serve, big forehand, blow people off the court, but you're not, you can't play like that the whole time, so what's plan B? Just run around and get everything in like Djokovic. Need that for the interviews. And brilliant spinal surgeon, he's still to this day a good friend of mine and a mentor. And he said, okay, you've got this line I'm gonna give you. And in the NHS there's lots of middle management. Um, and I'm not going to get into, into my, my <laughs> views on that. But this particular person's view on it was that, that it was, there was too much middle management in the NHS. And if you get asked in your interview, what is a major issue in your opinion with the NHS? He said, only use this in one or two scenarios and I'll share them with you in a moment. And he said, tell them, I think that there's far too much middle management, it's too bloated and we should streamline that and it will, fi it will help fix the NHS. Mm. Okay, that was his answer. And he said, only use that in one or two scenarios. One. The interview's going so well, you don't think that if you say that it's controversial, the people are going to not let you in. Or it's gone so badly Who that does? it doesn't matter and you may just be able to bring it back because someone will go, ah, this guy really knows what he's doing. We've underestimated him and he brings it back. So w why am I talking about that? I'm talking about that in these interviews. If you've gone in and you're super dynamic, you've done all this resource investigation, you've got something where you're like, this is standing me out and I'm not getting a reaction. I'm not getting a wink off the hiring manager or like I'm not getting smiles, like they're just very flat and not engaging. Then think about that in, in, in the analogy of a sports game. Yep. Switch, switch it up in the middle of the approach. Th sit there and go, okay, do I, do I wanna be here? Yeah, I think I would like to be here. Let's test the walk with them. Let's start chucking a few things in there that could, that could really grab their attention. And you could start talking more about the Belbin or thinking about something else or asking them, well, why don't you use these? Yep. If, if you're sitting there going, you know what, actually, I don't want to be here, start ch maybe challenge them in a humble and polite way. Say, yep. what, can I just ask why, why don't actually you use these things in your hiring process? I'm, I'm interested to know because I think they have value. Yep. And then that may get them thinking. And again, it could bring back something that wasn't going that well. 100%. And that's a great, a couple of great points right there is A, just like uh, Elliot said, when, when you're going to a company, they're selling to you, but you also are selling to them. And it's got to be a great fit. That's the number one thing. I, you guys, I've said this, and I was just talking to somebody about this, but like people can smell desperation a mile away. And so, like, I know a lot of you guys are really excited to break into medical device sales, and that's so, so awesome. But when you're like, this is why I tell you guys, you got to be reaching out to several different companies. You need to be networking, you need to be talking, because if you're just going in with one option, all your eggs in one basket, and you're like, oh, I need this job, this is all I have, please. It's going to come off a certain way to especially who's ever doing the hiring. Yeah. And so just being able to make sure that it's going to be a good fit for you. And, and that's another thing. When I was going through every interview that I've gone through in my life, it's I'm interviewing them, making sure it's going to be a good fit with me as mm -hmm. well. Can I see myself here? Will I enjoy it? Just as they have to see that with me as well as an employee. And so that's a conversation with you guys I really want you to uh, hear. But also... To your point, when you bring in something that they haven't uh, thought of, or it's something that hasn't thinking, that gets their, like you said, the wheels turning of like, this person could be a real big asset to our team. What else could they bring to this team that we might not have thought of yet? Yep. And that's just like a great point because again, this is where we talk about your, your past stories and your past experiences. Yes, you have to make them do the job to get the job. What have you done in the past that could make you set up for this position now? Yeah. But also what we talk about is being true to who you are. If that's truly who you are and you have awesome experiences, you have stuff, each and every one of you are valuable and bring something very valuable to each and every organization. Be able to display that because again, we're not just trying to check the boxes and that's one thing I wanna just say is sometimes at these bigger companies, it can be, there's a checklist. We're just going check, 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 okay, move, check, 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 right? Check the boxes, but then exceed the boxes. Come out, be different, because that's what's gonna get you remembered. Just being like everybody else, that's why I'm always just coaching you guys, we're not here to be the same. Each and every one of you are different and have something valuable to offer an organization, or and just being you. Bring that out. 
because that's who they're going to hire. Yes, you can do all if you can do all the bare minimum. That's great, but that's we can teach that stuff on a, a general level. But can you be you? And that's what's going to help stand you out. And so I just want to really want to touch on this point because I know that's going to help. You also have other break-in stories yeah, where yeah. you're staying true into yourself going into it. But also, I do want to just say this. We're 30 minutes in. I haven't even gotten into much detail of Innovis, uh, what we yeah, are, you know, say, like, say who, we uh, are. <laughs> who we are. So uh, real quick, Innovis, you know, because yeah. <laughs> you, were, you were a medical, uh, you're a surgeon, you went into it, and then you started getting into this role, and we, yeah. we'll go into that, but... Who yeah, is? Yeah, well, we'll touch it. We'll, we'll touch on it very reasonably and sort of the reason why we, we exist. So yeah, we just, we just go through my background. Person that grew up playing sport, wasn't your traditional shoe in for medical school, got in, loved it. Yep. And the whole way through, I went in going, I'm going to go and do surgery because I'm practical. It's a really cool, it's a really cool, if that's my job every day, how cool is that? That's, yep. That could be a lot worse. Um, <laughs> so that's, that was the approach I was taking. And I was then starting to, it comes, comes to, I started thinking about how I was going to break into surgery, which is, again, one of the most competitive specialties um, in the country, in, in the United Kingdom, same in the, the US when yep. it comes to matching and residency programs. And so I started my process of breaking into that in my second year of medical school. Because I was like, that's I know I want to do that. Mm. There's nothing that's going to be able to change my opinion of I would like to be a surgeon. Yeah. And so I started building my my CV and started doing all those things that would help me get a a training number or a training program or residency post, whatever you want to call it, in the United Kingdom. And I started looking at going, okay, I'm going to need to start learning some surgical skills. Yeah. I'm going to need to start going to some surgical conferences and hearing about this profession and I kept turning up to these surgical conferences and I'm seeing these junior surgeons saying I've I've created a, um, a laparoscopic box trainer with a shoe box and a webcam because we can't afford these things they're too expensive I need to do more training and I was thinking oh, yeah that's interesting and that's that's noted um, and then I met my co-founder Jordan who is I mean I met him a long pre- prior to this but um, he, he's we have a mutual best friend he's yeah. my best buddy from medical school and Jordan was looking at going and doing postgraduate medicine. Yep. So he'd done an undergrad degree, he was going to go and do postgrad. And he wanted to do a medically related dissertation, so he had something to talk about. So he, again, he was thinking about how he's gonna break into medical school. Yeah. He's not come from a traditional background. His sport is, is rugby and golf. He's annoyingly good at golf, um, <laughs> but he's a very, very good rugby player as a, as a, as a junior. Yeah. And so he'd, he'd, he'd focused on the rugby a little bit longer than I had on tennis. So I'd come out and focused in academia, Jordan really, pushed on with rugby and so he'd gone this like slightly different route and he wanted to stand out at medical school so he did a dissertation for his undergrad around predicting laparoscopic skills mm. couldn't get a simulator no one would give him one so he built one and we're sitting there over beers talking about this and, and I said to him look look Jordan I- I've been looking at this for a while here are the issues the simulators exist for training surgeons they're way too expensive mm. they're really difficult to access and they're really not very good. They use an old modality for training, which is which is virtual reality, and mm-hmm. that has drawbacks in terms of fidelity and haptics and these sorts of things. And I said to him, I think that because of that, we're still training surgeons like we trained them a hundred years ago. Yeah. Where the majority of the early learning curves on the patient bedside. And I said to him, I, th- I think there's an opportunity for for you and I because we've got. We, we meet in the middle with our sporting and our competitive edge, but we're very, very we're wired very differently, which yep. is very important in co-founders. Yep. So I think there's an opportunity for us to completely change the way in which we train surgeons in the whole world. Bear in mind we're like 22 at this point in time <laughs> and we have no money. I was like, there's a real opportunity here though. And, and, and here it is. We need to start training surgeons like we train as elite athletes. Yep. yep. And we need to solve these three things that we've seen here that you've experienced that I'm experiencing. And so here's, our, here's how we're gonna get going. And we started at the bottom of what is a continuum of fidelity or whatever you wanna call it for yep. surgical training. And we quite literally founded the business um, making these laparoscopic box trainers for surgeons to buy and use themselves. So instead of making it out of a shoe box and a webcam and spending their hours, which is valuable hours, yep. making it, we do it for them. 
and they could buy it online and it would turn up. And that was the first step to us with a much wider vision for, for building a business, which ultimately has the mission to become the world's partner for, for surgical training. Um, and yeah, we started in a bedroom with a heat gun, a sheet of plastic and a drill. Um, at 22. At 22, yeah. Um, <laughs> with that, that grand vision of saying, yeah, we're obviously the best place to completely solve this, uh, this unmet need for the whole, the whole globe. Um, and 10 years on now, we're, um, we're actually well on the way to that mission to becoming the world's partner for surgical uh, training. I love it. How many, because I, I really want to touch on this, how many countries are you currently in? 76. 76. Yeah. So at 22, two guys are like, hey, let's just try this. We're, you're going through med school and you're like, hey, let's see if this happens. And, you know, 10 years later, you guys are in 76 countries. Yeah. You're the leader for training in the UK. Yeah. We've just expanded to the US and yeah. just to see your vision and where it's going because this is still just the beginning yeah you know we're still like, miles away from where the vision is 